Welcome to today's webinar on nicotine in pregnancy. I'm Hazel Cheeseman, I'm Director of Policy at ASH, and um, I'm just going to run through some um, housekeeping before I introduce our two excellent speakers. Um, if you have any technical problems during the webinar, can you use the chat function on the panel on the right hand side of the screen and let um, John and Vicky know that you've got some problems and they will try and help you. Um, if you have any questions during the uh, webinar, then uh, you, we, we really want to hear from you. There's a question tab on that right-hand bar, so you can type the questions in. Um, only, our, only us as organisers can see them, and we will put those to the speakers at the, at the end of the session. We're also recording the webinar, and it will go online, so you'll be able to share it with colleagues and others who are interested. So I'm just going to say a few words to introduce the challenge group and um, the issue of smoking in pregnancy before handing over um, first to Professor Linda Bald, who's going to talk about nicotine in pregnancy, and then to Professor Peter Hayek, who's going to give us some more details specifically around um, e-cigarettes. And then we're going to be joined in the panel session by Jo Locker from Public Health England and Louise Hand, who's a public health midwife from South Tees, um, to have a, a wider discussion about um, nicotine e-cigarettes and, and their role in um, pregnancy. So we're, we're really keen to hear from you um, so that we can have a really good discussion session at the end. So definitely get those questions in. Um, this is just to, re to remind me and to remind you where, those question, um, where that question tab is on the right hand side of your screen. So just a quick introduction to the Smoking and Pregnancy Challenge Group. We are a, co a wide coalition of um, uh, NGOs and professional groups and academics who've come together to, um, to find ways to reduce rates of smoking in pregnancy. Uh, we were established in 2012 following a challenge from the then Public Health Minister, and we've produced this sort of array of policy reports, which are on the, on the side of this slide here, um, making recommendations to government no, locally and nationally about um, what needs to be improved and changed so that we can more quickly reduce rates of smoking in pregnancy. Um, but we've also done um, a lot of work to um, support frontline delivery as well and, um, uh, and local networks and distribute information to be supportive of that objective. And I'm not going to talk a lot about that, that now, um, but if you want more information about the resources that we have, you can visit the um, Smoke, Smoking in Pregnancy Challenge Group webpage. Um, we'll circulate these details after the um, after the webinar and we'd also encourage you if you haven't already to join the smoke free pregnancy information network which will be getting monthly updates um, on uh, smoking in pregnancy issues so without further ado ah yes this is just a remind uh, remind me to tell you that we have um, two webinars coming up which you can um, register for uh, we have one on incentive schemes at the end of this month on the 28th of March and then one at the end of April on um, looking at health visiting and relapse prevention, um, which should also be very interesting. So I will now hand over to Professor Linda Bald, who is the Bruce and John Asher Professor of Public Health at Edinburgh University. Linda's also the co-chair of the Smoking and Pregnancy Challenge Group, alongside uh, Klee Harmer, who's the Chief Executive of SAMS. Um, and Linda's going to talk to us about the evidence relating to the use of nicotine in pregnancy. So I will hand over to Linda at this stage. Linda, I think you might want to make your um, slides a little larger on your screen. Um, yeah, well, John and I talked about this before. I think we decided... Okay. It's fine. <laughs> John, are you, are you still happy with that, Hazel? Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks, Linda. Okay, great. Um, delighted to be here and to be able to speak about this important topic. So. I'm probably only, only going to take about 15 minutes and I will really try and set the scene for what Peter is going to cover later. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is very briefly the importance of reducing smoking in pregnancy, which Hazel's already begun to uh, speak about, then uh, talk about nicotine replacement therapy in pregnancy, uh, just set the scene for what is nicotine and uh, why it's important to understand this issue in the context of tobacco harm reduction. I'll they then say something about the Cochrane reviews, which talk about pharmacotherapies, both in terms of efficacy and safety. Um, then introduce you to the SNAP trial, which uh, gives us valuable evidence from the UK context on both those issues. 
Um, and then talk about some ongoing work we're doing in a new NIHR funded program looking at evidence from non-randomized trials, non-randomized studies, pardon me, um, on nicotine in pregnancy. And then finally, I'll, I'll just say something about ongoing research and I look forward to your questions. So as many of you will know, we have made tremendous progress in reducing uh, rates of smoking in the population, including in pregnant women. And we were delighted that our most recent national tobacco control plan in England has set a, a, a pregnancy specific target of reaching a prevalence of 6% at the time of delivery by 2022. But unfortunately, we are not making progress at the rate that we need to. And that's why the challenge groups work is still so essential uh, in, in collaboration with yourselves. Um, we have just had the latest SATOD data released, which is not on this slide. So um, the data for quarter three for 2018-19 have just been released this week by NHS Digital, and smoking at the time of delivery was 10.5% in those latest data, that's the same as the quarter before, quarter two, um, and there's no significant change from this time last year where it was about 10.8%, but that's not a significant drop. Of course, the variations remain very significant, ranging from 1.5% of smoking at the time of delivery in Richmond uh, up to um, just over 27% in Blackpool. Um, in relation to the gradient that we're all familiar with, you know that women who live in the in the 10% most deprived communities in England have far higher rates. One in five of them continue to smoke at the time of delivery, right down to uh, around 2% for the least deprived decile. So that, that's the inequality challenge. We've not managed to narrow the gap in recent years, and, and those women living in those communities are a real priority for addressing smoking and pregnancy. The same for age. Uh, we know that many of our partners in the challenge group uh, Tommy's and, and other baby charities who work with teenage pregnant women. Um, the rates are far higher in those groups and also younger women. And the rates of smoking and pregnancy decline with maternal age. So again, this is a, a priority for support and for action. Um, I think everyone listening to the webinar will be well aware of the risks of smoking in pregnancy. We did a, a new analysis, I shouldn't say we, my colleagues with Hazel and others did a new analysis uh, last year looking at uh, updating some of the evidence and trying to uh, communicate in a simple way uh, what some of the risks were on average across uh, studies in relation to low birth weight, uh, the very uh, important potential risk of stillbirth with smoking still being the leading preventable cause of, of stillbirth, miscarriage, preterm birth, and then also uh, health impacts on, on the baby in relation to heart defects um, and also sudden infant death postpartum. So we're very well aware of these. They apply across the globe. Uh, we've seen new evidence from countries in Latin America, for example, just last year, showing very clearly that these risks are consistently found. And of course, it's not just combustible smoking. We also see significant risks for pregnant women who use smokeless tobacco products, which of course is relevant for our South Asian communities, particularly in the UK. And in fact, we're doing some research on that at the moment. So moving on to the, the main topic for today, nicotine in pregnancy. So uh, in the UK, we are unusual globally in that we routinely provide nicotine replacement therapy to pregnant women. That is not the case around the world. And that really has arisen since around 2005 when the MHRA changed the licensing rules on nicotine replacement therapy to allow prescription for pregnant women, but also a whole variety of other priority groups I've just listed a couple of them here, uh, patients with uh, heart disease and children over the age of 12. We did a survey of stop smoking services a few, few years old now, uh, when we had more services, more comprehensively across the country, but we found that basically all services who were supporting pregnant women in any numbers were providing NRT routinely. And when we developed the NICE guidance on smoking cessation and pregnancy back in 2010, um, it included um, a recommendation guidance that NRT could be provided, but emphasized that professionals should use their clinical judgment and also discuss the risks and benefits with women. And th those guidelines have not been updated since 2010, but there is currently a guidance group um, that NICE has convened to update a suite of guidance and pregnancy is included in that. So I think we'll be seeing that coming out in about 18 months time. 
Unfortunately, as I'll explain in more detail as a moment, there isn't any evidence of effectiveness for NRT for smoking cessation in pregnancy. And there's a, a range of mechanisms that might explain that lack of effectiveness. The key one um, is probably the increased metabolism of nicotine when a woman is pregnant. Um, and there's a whole variety of, of uh, biological changes that occur, but of course, increased metabolism is one of them. The other big issue is that women don't like using NRT, so there's limited adherence to the amount and frequency um, that should be used ideally to prevent uh, or to support smoking cessation or prevent relapse to smoking. So just in relation to some basics about nicotine, um, I think most people will know this, but it's really important to emphasize uh, this is something that doesn't just um, exist within tobacco it's uh, it's common in a whole variety of plants which is why when you look at cotinine levels in the population you'll find some of us have most of us have some cotinine in our systems because we get it from vegetables basically um, but also obviously it's included in the tobacco plant nicotine can be produced synthetically but it's very expensive and and widely regarded as not commercially viable and that means that it's important to remember that the nicotine in cigarettes and other nicotine containing products, including NRT, comes from the tobacco leaf. So it has a common source. And nicotine is both a sedative and a stimulant. stimulant. Uh, the body responds in a whole variety of ways to nicotine, including increasing the heart rate, blood pressure. There's also potentially beneficial um, effects of nicotine. We see that Parkinson's disease is less common in people who smoke. Um, and there is evidence that, um, and that nicotine can improve memory and cognition. And uh, indeed, there have been some trials in different populations to look at the potential benefit, beneficial effects of things like NRT. Nicotine can be addictive, but it depends very much on the mode of delivery. And NRT, a prescribed medicine, is widely regarded as not uh, dependence forming. So we have guidance on nicotine use in the UK. Um, we have our tobacco harm reduction guidance, uh, which is also being updated in that suite of nice guidance I mentioned, published in 2013. When we met as a group, we didn't include pregnancy in this guidance. That's important to emphasize. But the reason it's valuable is because of the systematic reviews that underpin it. They're all still available on the NICE website. And they reviewed all the evidence on nicotine, um, the, the physiological effects and outcomes from using NRT. And the evidence makes it clear that there are no circumstances under which it's safer to smoke than to use nicotine replacement therapy. Um, and the guidance emphasized the importance of nicotine containing products for temporary abstinence, for cutting down smoking, ideally as a route to stop, for smoking cessation, and for longer term use, potentially over many years, if that helps people avoid relapse to smoking. So that's all fine, um, but we haven't really made much progress in relation to what the public think about nicotine. I don't have time to show you the evidence that we've included in our recent Public Health England reports on e-cigarettes, which basically show that people are still very confused about this. They think that nicotine causes cancer, they think that nicotine is harmful, um, and uh, those perceptions have really not improved in recent years. And when you look at studies with pregnant women, it's very clear that pregnant women are concerned about nicotine. They may know about the risks of smoking. Generally, they do, although they may not understand all the risks. Um, but they also think that nicotine is harmful alone, separate from tobacco. So they're concerned about safety. They're also concerned about addictiveness. So this, this concept of using another nicotine product, continuing to crave nicotine, and therefore that using things like NRT might actually increase, increase their risk of relapse to smoking after they have the baby or indeed during the pregnancy. And I've just included here, I, I could have uh, provided other references as well. Um, we did a large uh, series of systematic reviews for NIHR and published a report a couple of years ago, but this is just one article from Sue Bowker and colleagues. A few quotes here just illustrating what pregnant women said about nicotine replacement therapy and nicotine. And then, of course, the other finding is, although we are better about this in the UK than most other countries, including the US, um, we still give very variable advice and support to pregnant women regarding nicotine replacement therapy and NRT. The advice might be good from Stop Smoking Services, but when women talk to their midwives or um, obstetricians or other uh, health professionals about this, they may well get conflicting messages and knowledge amongst health professionals generally around nicotine remains poor. So 
in relation to nicotine use in pregnancy, we have a Cochrane review, which I've given you the reference for at the bottom of this slide, updated in 2015, looking at pharmacological interventions for smoking cessation in pregnancy. Um, in the most recent review, so the search was done, I think, in the summer of 2015, they identified nine trials of NRT and one of bupropion done in the US. Um, and in relation to safety, there were no differences between the women who stopped smoking and used NRT in relation to miscarriage, stillbirth, premature birth, low birth weight, um, uh, adverse outcomes for infants that would result in them being admitted to neonatal intensive care, um, congenital abnormalities, neonatal death and other outcomes. Um, there were some non-serious side effects observed with the women who used NRT. Um, and these are the things you see in the general population, nausea, skin irritation from patches, really not liking the gum. Um, but these data were not sufficient to be pooled to look at uh, whether those outcomes were consistent or, or um, found across a range of studies. So basically, just to emphasize, the Cochrane found, Review found no difference. And that basically means that they couldn't identify, and identify any serious risks from women using NRT in pregnancy. So that's fine, that provides data from a range of countries, primarily the US, I have to say, in relation to the trials. There's also a trial in France. But probably for us here in the UK, the most relevant one is the SNAP trial, funded by NIHR HTA, led by Professor Tim Coleman at the University of Nottingham. Um, and this was a large trial, over a thousand women, and who had to be smoking at least five cigarettes a day when they were enrolled in 10 pre-pregnant pregnancy, uh, validated by carbon monoxide. They were given behavioral support for up to eight weeks and a 16 hour nicotine patch. As you know, women are advised not to wear the patch overnight when they're pregnant. Um, and then the control arm were given the same behavioral support with a placebo patch. And then they were followed up um, in relation to the main outcomes at one month and then at delivery. And then the babies were followed up until they were two years old, which I'll talk about in a moment. So the SNAP findings that were similar to the trial in France and trials in the US <clears throat> basically showed um, that um, at four weeks, it looked like the NRT group were, were doing better. So that's the first bar on the left-hand side. You can see that there was a significant difference in cessation rates for women at one month in the NRT arm compared to the control arm. But when you got to the point of delivery, that difference was not significant anymore. So delivery was the primary outcome for the trial, and that suggested that that single product, the patch, was not effective for smoking cessation. Um, pardon me, this, uh, this is a, uh, a table that is a meta-analysis, so pooling the results of the various trials, and you can see that um, there's one by Tim Coleman and colleagues at the top here that's included, um, and essentially just showing that when you pull the data from the trials together at that time when this meta-analysis was done, um, it really doesn't show that NRT has a significant effect on smoking cessation. So that's effectiveness, and I'm going to talk in a moment about the work that we're doing now to see um, if we can look more closely about a different regime for NRT and, and why that might help women and more than a single product. Um, and this was the two-year follow-up from the SNAP trial. And effectively, um, they were following up the babies for two years. It was primarily by questionnaire. And the outcome they were looking for here was survival without impairment. So no disability amongst the infants or problems with development. And I've just listed here the tools that they use. They also looked at respiratory symptoms and whether the, the women had stopped smoking over the longer term. Um, this just shows you the response rate. They weren't able to follow up all the women, but they had a good response um, over the two arms. Just move on to the results, conscious of time. Um, so this is a really important slide. So these are the infant outcomes at two years from the SNAP trial. And just to remind you there, this survival with no impairment is the primary outcome. And you can see that there were significantly more babies in the nicotine replacement therapy arm, i.e. the women who'd used NRT in pregnancy to stop smoking, than in the women in the placebo arm. There were slightly higher respiratory problems, but not significant. Um, and they did it the analysis in a couple of different ways and found the same results. So the implications, this was the first trial that looked at infant outcomes up to two years. Um, it's really the first one that found a beneficial effect of nicotine replacement therapy on pregnant smokers' children. Um, and one of the potential hypotheses is that 
even though the NRT wasn't very successful for smoking cessation, there were undoubtedly a lot of women who used it to cut down their smoking, if, even if they didn't completely quit. And that probably had an impact on the outcomes for children. So uh, the work that we're, my colleagues are doing now, again, at Nottingham is looking at safety from non-randomized trials. And there are a whole bunch of these studies. Um, and essentially, they give us really good information because we can look at different outcomes across a broader range of um, studies in women in different countries. And these are the main outcomes that are looked at in the non-randomized studies, preterm birth, birth weight, small for gestational age, stillbirth, congenital abnormalities, and other outcomes. So the bottom line here is these findings from the non-randomized trials are consistent with those from trials and they provide additional detail. Um, they primarily look at women who smoke or use NRT or both in pregnancy. Um, and overall, for the outcomes mentioned in the last slide, there are fewer uh, preg negative pregnancy related outcomes when NRT is used compared to smoking. Um, so uh, NRT used by smokers, um, is not associated with poor outcomes, but smoking alone is. So NRT probably has a protective effect. Even if the women don't completely quit, we're looking at better outcomes here for the infant. Um, there's one outcome that looks worse in the NRT users, and that's infant colic. I'm no expert on that condition. I know it's difficult to assess. The causes are different, difficult to identify. Clearly, in relation to some of the other outcomes in, that we observe for smoking pregnancy, however, it's not nearly as severe. Um, so it's if it is a risk, it's probably one that can be managed. So uh, that review of non-randomized studies is part of a large program of work we're doing now, again, funded by uh, NIHR, led by Professor Tim Coleman. It's a program. It contains a series of work streams, variety of systematic reviews. One is on safety. But crucially within the program, we are um, now designing a trial of higher dose NRTs, so that's combination therapy. Basically, we know in routine practice and stop smoking services, that's what pregnant women are commonly provided. There's some observational evidence to suggest the outcomes are better. It basically means, means women are getting more nicotine, and that will probably deal with some of these uh, issues around metabolism that I mentioned. And if women can be supported and encouraged to use enough and for long enough, it may well really help them stop smoking, but we won't know that for sure until the trial produces its results. So there should be some valuable new evidence there. So just to finish, you know the issues around smoking and pregnancy, a priority to address. In the UK, NRT is widely prescribed in pregnancy. Um, we have a high quality UK trial that adds to other evidence to suggest that single product NRT doesn't look very effective for smoking cessation, but it is safe. And non-randomized studies also suggest that using nicotine replacement therapy is far safer than smoke, smoking. Um, so the bottom line is that although we have ongoing research underway, and Peter's also going to talk about another important study, the priority is to help uh, women to stop smoking and pregnancy, even if they continue to use nicotine in a less harmful form than in tobacco. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda, and uh, Chair's dream, you finished a minute early. Um, I'm just going to ask you, while we hand over the control to Peter for his presentation, um, just one of the questions that's come through, somebody was asking about smoking prevalence among women who are accessing mental health services. I, I'm not aware that there is any um, data on this, but I don't know if you wanted to, to comment at all on um, the sort of additional risk factors around women with mental health conditions who might be pregnant. Yeah, so I'm not, I don't have those figures to hand. I know from the psychiatric morbidity survey, we could probably combine whether people are pregnant and then obviously the mental health conditions that are assessed there. But as you know, that survey still sadly only happens every 10 years uh, or every 10 years. Um, so we don't have good figures, but it, obviously we know that uh, rates of smoking in the um, mental health service using population in general are far higher than the general population. And of course, women, there are women of childbearing age in those groups who become pregnant. So the combination of their mental health conditions, which of course uh, are associated with a whole range of other risks for themselves, and the fact that they're tobacco users will make those high risk pregnancies. So I think in mental health services, um, and stop smoking, we need to be partnering. Uh, and that's why the mental health, um, not the mental health challenge group, is it Hazel? It's the mental health partnership. The, the mental health and smoking partnership. Yeah. Which of course Ash has recently <laughs> seen. Um, one of the things Hazel and I, of course, haven't had a conversation about is how we combine the work of those two groups. But I think the question just posed 
perhaps suggest that's a conversation yeah. we should yeah, that's a, that's a good thought, Linda. We should have a have a have a conversation about that. Um, the other thing I just wanted to quickly ask you and, and encourage people to to add their questions. We have got a few more, but we'll take them at the end. Um, you mentioned buprofen as well as NRT, but not varenicline, also known as Champix. Um, presumably, that's because it is not recommended for use in pregnancy. That's correct. So it's not licensed for use in pregnancy in the UK. I would say there is some research underway. My colleague Cher, uh, Cheryl Onkin in the US uh, has been doing a trial, but we're not we're not currently able to prescribe it in pregnancy. Great, thanks Linda. Well, I encourage you to uh, um, put more questions in the question sidebar and we'll pick them up at the end. Um, uh, thank you to those of you who've already put some in. So we're now gonna hand over to um, Professor Peter Hayek. Um, Pro Peter is the Professor of Clinical Psychology and the Director of Health and Lifestyle of the Health and Lifestyle Research Unit at the Wilson Institute of Preventative Medicine at Queen Mary University. Peter, that's quite a mouthful. Um, and so Peter's going to be talking about the effectiveness of e-cigarettes as a cessation aid and talking about a recent RCT that he's been leading um, and then um, go on to talk about a trial around um, pregnant women. So Peter, over to you. All right, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Uh, so, I'll be talking about two trials, uh, one of them, the recently published one, and one which is ongoing and concerns pregnancy. So, this is the first one, uh, comparing uh, e-cigarettes with nickel replacement treatment within UK Stop Smoking Services. Uh, this is something we are supposed to do. I have no links with any e-cigarette manufacturers. Uh, my research into these things has been funded by all these august bodies. Uh, the trial was a collective effort. A lot of other people were involved in this. Uh, now, we already had two rather old trials looking at the efficacy of e-cigarettes. One of them was just comparing e-cigarettes with and without nicotine, which does not actually uh, convey that much useful information. The other one had the same thing, but also included a patch uh, arm of the trial. Both trials used very early first generation uh, cigar like e cigarettes with low nicotine delivery, and they had very limited uh, behavioral support. Uh, the overall conclusion was that e cigarettes with nicotine do better than those without nicotine, and the patches and these uh, early e-cigarettes had about the same efficacy, but the efficacy was pretty low. So this was the first trial to look at modern e-cigarettes. And we, com we used as a comparator combination nickel replacement treatment. And this is why, because that's the most commonly used uh, approach within the UK Stop Smoking Services. As you can see here, over half of people coming to the service are treated with nicotine replacement treatment. <clears throat> and among those, more than half of those 54%, 32, are treated with combination treatment. So that was our comparator. Uh, people were randomized to one or the other, and they started to use their product on the target quit date. So we didn't have a differential dropout just in case people were keen to use one or, not, uh, or not the other. But the inclusion criteria included one which asked people whether they mind whether they use one or the other. <clears throat> and if people had strong preference or really didn't want one of them, then they were not in the trial. So uh, the hope was that people don't really mind which one they're using and indeed uh, the attendance and adherence and all that and dropout, uh, that all suggested that indeed that was the case. We elicited a commitment from them. They signed a little form saying, I promise I won't be using the non-allocated product for the first four weeks at least. And indeed, they stuck with it pretty well. I think there were a few who, uh, who used something they were not supposed to, but overall this worked all right. And then they had weekly face-to-face -face support sessions as per usual practice uh, within these services. I somehow drop, dropped a slide there showing which services it was. It was four uh, services which, have, uh, which are still functioning, as you may know, 
a lot of services are now biting the dust, but these were still providing face-to-face -face contact with uh, dedicated full-time advisors. And after those four-week recessions, people were followed up at six months and 12 months, and those who reported abstinence at 12 months or smoking less than 50% of their cigarettes they did at baseline, they were invited to come back for carbon monoxide reading to validate their claim of abstinence and to see if the reduction in those who reported reduction indeed reached at least 50%. So in the NRT arm, people had a choice of all these different products and they were encouraged to use a combination. And typically it would be the type of combination within the routine service, that means patch plus one of the shorter acting products. Uh, the mouse spray was particularly popular there. And 88% opted for the combinations. So a few people use just the patch, uh, most two different products. Another thing, they were allowed to switch. So if they started, say, on nicotine chewing gum and didn't like it, they were able to switch to uh, inhalator or lozenge or something else. And this was this was a bit surprising. Too many people did switch. Sorry, is there? I hear some noises there. All well? Hello? Do you hear me? Peter, we can hear you. It's fine. I think we're just having some interference. Oh. Uh, Louise, you need to mute yourself. I think that's the issue. <laughs> that, do you carry on, Peter? Sorry. All right. So let me continue to talk to myself. There's a uh, so a surprising number of people switched to another pro product, and the supplies went on for about three months. Uh, well, for three months after that, uh, but although if they requested a longer supply, some services did provide it. The cost to NHS of this on average is about 120 pounds for the three month supply of one product. Supplying two products doesn't make it twice as effective because the second product is usually used not fully, that means not 15 pieces of chewing gum a day, but only a few to top up. Uh, but still it would add additional cost if there is a dual product. For e-cigarettes, we used this one shown here, which is a very simple refillable uh, product, and it was supplied with some spare atomizers and one bottle of e-liquid at the time. That was before the uh, TPD, the European Tobacco, Pro Tobacco Product direction, direction, became binding. We were able to use larger bottles, so that was a 30-milliliter bottle, which would last two to three weeks. And people could ask for another one, but very few people did, only 7% did. Everybody then got their own e-liquids. And that was a strong advice. We didn't want people to feel that this is what they have to use. They were instructed to shop around, try different e-liquids. E-liquids themselves are not expensive, and they may prefer to have a different strength of e-liquid, different flavor, and they may even find this particular device not to their liking and they may want to buy a different one. And indeed, very, you know, almost everybody switched straight away to other liquids and 75% of them also switched to a different flavor. We supplied the tobacco flavor. I think if we did this again or next time, we would start with uh, fruit flavor because these are the most popular. But it doesn't really matter as long as people are encouraged and allowed to find their own. And the cost of this, uh, during the study, this particular device was discontinued and the new one was a bit more expensive. This is the more expensive one, 30 pounds. Uh, the original one was, I think, about 22. So the cost is much less than with NRT. Uh, we got a reasonable follow-up rate. You always lose some people in these type of studies where there's intensive face-to-face -face support because people who are not doing well eventually get embarrassed facing their uh, advisor and telling them they're still smoking and some people drop out and so we had a uh, drop out but about 80 percent followed up which is similar to previous randomized control trials conducted within 
absorbing services. There were three big studies done previously, and you can see their follow-up rates, and so it was very similar. And uh, we analyzed it on intention to treat basis. That means we assume that everybody not standing up is smoking. And this is somewhat harsh assumption which you make in stop smoking studies, uh, but that's the current norm that's called the Russell Standard Approach with a few other ways uh, on how you can calculate your outcomes. But we also did multiple imputations and that showed very consistent results. So first of all, what did e-cigarettes do compared to nicotine replacement treatment initially when we were still seeing these people once a week and we were able to monitor their withdrawal discomfort? Uh, people on e-cigarettes had significantly less uh, edges to smoke and the edges they still have were significantly less severe. And now this is the active ingredient of all treatments we currently have for smokers. Bupropion, varinicline, and nicotine replacement treatment, they all do the same thing. They reduce withdrawal discomfort. And e-cigarettes seem to do it better than NRT. Uh, they also had lower increase in irritability, restlessness, concentration. Uh, there were even differences in hunger and depression, but these didn't reach significance. By week four, as we know, when people stop smoking and maintain abstinence for four weeks, most of these things are back to normal. So there was little withdrawal discomfort uh, in, in everybody who was quit. But the rise to the four weeks, that journey was much easier for people who were using e-cigarettes. Uh, e-cigarettes also reduced better ratings. They were seen as more helpful and more satisfying compared to cigarettes than NRT. So in summary, we had a good adherence in both study arms. I didn't show you that slide, but almost everybody used their product daily over the first four weeks in both NRT and e-cigarette arm. But then the big difference emerged as people carried on using e-cigarettes over that initial period while in NRT group uh, they were gradually stopping using NRT. E-cigarettes received more favorable ratings. So how does it translate to abstinence? Uh, at one year, validated abstinence rates were um, over, just over 18% on e-cigarettes and just under 10% on NRT. People who didn't quit and claimed to cut down by over 50%, they were all invited in, and that many people were confirmed to actually take less toxins or inhale less smoke as indexed by carbon monoxide reading. And you can see again, there were more in the e-cigarette arm than in the NRT arm. This, however, doesn't provide totally full picture because within a year, a lot of people who were clearly failing on NRT or finding quick, uh, abstinence difficult were actually finding their way to e-cigarettes. There were a few in the e-cigarette arm who ended up using NRT, as you can see on this slide, uh, but many more in the NRT arm were using e-cigarettes. So at one year, although they were counted as if they quit due to NRT, in fact, they quit due to e-cigarettes. Uh, and that's difficult to handle. One possible approach to this, you just remove these people from the sample. You can't reassign them because the, you know, the original randomization you have to adhere to. But if you remove these people from the sample, then the difference between uh, the two products becomes much more marked. And now the, uh, the, the ratio is over two, uh, the difference between 8% and 18%. Now, we noticed a, a thing which was remarkable. In the NRT arm, if you just look at abstainers, 9% were still using the NRT at one year. And that tallies with what we know from previous studies. Some people who are quitting with NRT need that crutch for a bit longer and carry on using NRT long term. But in e-cigarette arm, we had 80% still vaping. Not all of them using nicotine e-cigarettes, 24% now nicotine-free, 56% using nicotine-containing e-cigarettes. 
those who were still using nicotine uh, reduced the strength from 18 uh, was the mean nicotine strength at the beginning and at one year it was 12. We don't know whether that means uh, a real reduction in nicotine intake or not. They may have learned how to use their apparatus better or they may have bought better uh, better devices which deliver higher nicotine levels even from lower nicotine liquid. So we have this issue about 80% still vaping, only 9% still using an RT. Is that a problem? Now it could be bad if this means that they are going to continue vaping for the next 20, 30 years and some health risk emerges eventually. And I'll come back to the possibility of some risks from long-term vaping later on. We know that over uh, two years, that no health risks have been noted. That's the Cochrane verdict. And from some other studies and follow-ups we currently have, uh, it looks like about three years of vaping, still no health risks. Uh, but we don't know about 20 or 30 years. So there is that possible negative sign. On the other hand, if this prevents relapse, and we know that long-term NRT use prevents relapse, so it's quite likely that long-term e-cigarette use would have the same function, that would be a good thing. It may also prevent discomfort, although most people get over the you know, craving for cigarettes and missing their cigarettes fairly quickly. Some people uh, become irritable and they remain irritable for a long time. It may, or we know that it does prevent weight gain, and it may maintain some smoking rewards. And I expect that most of these people who continue to vape did it primarily because they enjoy it. So you know, whatever it does for smokers, whatever positive reinforcement it provides, uh, now they have an option to carry on obtaining that. And so this needs to be balanced versus the potential possible health risk if they carry on for decades. Peter, I'm just going to give you a two-minute warning, although you might go over a little, I guess. Ah, okay, so I better speed up. Adverse yeah. reaction, nothing really to write home about. Respiratory symptoms, this is very interesting. People on e-cigarettes have less cough and phlegm. These are signs of respiratory infection, and it looks like there is a possibility that using e-cigarettes actually uh, prevents you, pr protects you from airborne infection. And there are some hypotheses about it. Several studies reported it earlier. And this is an interesting effect. Needs to be uh, still confirmed by some controlled trials. But if that's the case, that would, again, counterbalance some of the potential health risks if it at the same time protects you from airborne infection. Uh, so speeding up, uh, I just go to possible reasons for e-cigarette superiority. Uh, better withdrawal relief, uh, better subjective effects, most likely also better nicotine tailoring. When you give people NRT, we insist on them using just up to 15 pieces of chewing gum a day or whatever, one patch a day. Here, they can actually select how much nicotine they want exactly the same way as when they smoke, they themselves decide how much nicotine they want. So better self-titration. And... Uh, Better nicotine, uh, a better tailoring of fruit, uh, tobacco, menthol, and so on, uh, flavors as well. So the conclusion for practice would be that these cigarettes generate much higher quit rates than NRT, achieve it at lower costs, and should become one of the treatment options. So the way the services explain to people you can have varaniclin or nicotine replacement treatment or bupropion, they should also add the cigarette starter pack to the mix. Now, how long do I still have? Um, well, you're at time, but I, we definitely want to hear the next few slides, Peter. So if you could co kind of go through them quickly, that would be great. Okay. So this is a trial where we don't have any results yet, uh, but it's sort of similar to the one I was just describing. Uh, it was comparing e-cigarettes and NRT in pregnant smokers. Uh, just a few words about safety of e-cigarettes in pregnancy. Linda covered most of this. Uh, smokers already consume nicotine, and in higher doses, so NRT is widely used. And uh, there are some other chemicals in e-cigarettes, but these are not expected to 
pose any risk to the fetus. Propylene glycol is approved for use in pregnancy in asthma inhalers. Glycerin has no known adverse effects. And again, glycerin syrup is fine in pregnancy. And uh, the trial includes very close monitoring of adverse events and pregnancy outcomes. So what do we do here? And this is a busy slide, so you may want to have a close look at it. We have research midwives in 23 sites identifying potential participants, women who smoke. And they are then randomized, those interested in taking part in the trial uh, are randomized, and everything is done over the phone and by mail. So they would be posted either e cigarette starter kit, very much like something like I was showing you before, or nicotine patches, 16 hour patches, with instructions on how to use them. They then get weekly phone calls, and they get followed up at the end of pregnancy and three months after the delivery to assess adverse events on mother and baby since delivery. Uh, we provide 16-hour patches. E-cigarettes are refillable. E-cigarettes, tobacco, this time they have a choice of tobacco or fruit flavored, but again, they're encouraged to find their own uh, strengths and flavors if they prefer that. And we based power calculations on 8% versus 14% quit rate, and the trial is recruiting about 1,200 pregnant women. So it's a huge, big trial. The recruitment is on target. Uh, we recruited about half of participants so far, follow, completed about 200 follow-ups, no adverse effects, which will be considered related to study uh, products have been noted so far. But we have another year to finish recruitment, and the results would be expected at the end of next year or early 2021. So that's all I've got here. Great. Thanks, Peter. Um, so we've got lots of questions, and we're now going to be joined uh, for the Q&A session by Linda and also Joe Locker from Public Health England. Joe is the Tobacco Control Manager at Public Health England, Senior Tobacco Control Manager. Sorry, Joe. And hopefully uh, we've managed to get Louise uh, Hand, the Public Health Midwife from South Tees, um, to also join. Louise, can, can you um, say hello? We'll make sure we can hear hello, you. Hello, I have joined. Oh, fantastic. Brilliant. Um, okay, so we've got um, lots of questions and I, I think I might like to kick off with um, a question uh, about e-cigarettes for all of our panellists to think about. So we're, we're, there's a couple of people who've asked this question, so I'll, I'll sort of um, frame it broadly. So there's a question around what advice um, frontline staff can provide to pregnant women about using e-cigarettes. Um, I'm just going to stick up on the screen as we talk about this, um, the um, uh, challenge group infographic. Linda, I wonder if you could come in first and, and just talk a bit about what your advice would be to frontline staff around um, speaking to women about who are smoking about e-cigarettes. Yes, yeah, certainly. So we produced a practical guide with the Royal College of Midwives and a whole variety of others, which I think most people will have seen. But if you haven't, it is on the Challenge Group website. And it essentially is about three foldable pages that takes through uh, takes co colleagues through what basically what they can and, and can't say about e-cigarettes. So um, if it, in a consultation with a smoker, I think talking about nicotine use in pregnancy and providing reassurance that it's not the nicotine that's harmful and it's fine to use an alternative, um, that e-cigarettes are widely used, um, that people do find them helpful and there's good evidence in the general population, um, and that it's far better that a woman vapes than she smokes. Um, clearly, uh, a health professional also needs to be very clear on a couple of other points. They can't be prescribed because they're not available on prescription. We don't have a product, so uh, they can only be bought by the woman unless the service offers a starter pack, um, which I think is unusual in pregnancy. Um, and then also that clearly we still have questions about uh, pregnancy specific effects and outcomes and that there is a large trial underway. But in the meantime, if the woman's smoking now, the priority is to support her not to smoke um, and vaping from all the evidence we have to date 
um, looks like a less harmful alternative. So I think it should be a positive conversation. Thanks, Linda. Louise, I wonder if you could add from your sort of experience um, of, of speaking to smokers, how you would talk to them about e-cigarettes, how you would sort of action that advice. Yeah, certainly. I think it's about having the right conversation, as was said, um, to remove any confusion for the pregnant women around the use of e-cigs, that we support the use of e-cigs as a safer alternative to smoking, um, and that we record them as a non-smoker, um, and just dispelling any myths around the use of e-cigs um, and any harmful effects. Um, as, as previously has been said, lots of women um, unfortunately think that it's the nicotine that harms the baby and it's about having the discussion around um, the effects of carbon monoxide rather than the nicotine. Thanks Louise. Um, Peter or Joe, do you have anything that you, you'd want to add to, to that discussion about the advice we should be providing around e-cigarettes? Peter? Oh, I think I go along with what was said. Yeah, anything you'd add from a PhD perspective? Um, I think just to reiterate the two key points um, that um, said by both, the comparator is always smoking. So um, these are women who are already um, highly addicted to, um, uh, are highly dependent and using high levels, risky levels of tobacco. So the comparator here is always to smoking. And also um, the latter point that um, if we do have a woman who switches completely to um, to vaping, then um, it's important that from a data perspective, they're recorded as not smoking. So if someone has switched completely, then, um, then recording them as a, as a non-smoker booking or delivery or wherever you're collecting the data is, is really important as well. Thanks, Jake. And, and I think we, ha we have a few questions about this point around the role of, of nicotine in pregnancy. A specific question, I guess, Linda, this might be one for you, um, whether neonates are being assessed for nicotine withdrawal symptoms when um, women are using it NRT in pregnancy. Um, is that something that's been looked at? Is that something we would expect to see? No, I, well, I certainly don't think in the UK we're assessing neonates. So, I mean, obviously, if a woman has been smoking during pregnancy, there may be a whole variety of things we want to assess with the infant, but that's not something that's routinely done. Um, there certainly are studies in the US looking at uh, babies being irritable and, um, you know, whether having a mum who smoked during pregnancy is related to some of that, but not from the nicotine replacement therapy. Um, as I say, in terms of those follow-up studies, the SNAP trial gives the longest follow-up. Um, and there's certainly that's not something we assess and it's not, not something we're concerned about. And, and presumably that's true in the in the e-cigarette trial too, Peter. It's not it's not a concern that you would have. Well, we we are following these uh, people up post delivery and uh, all these things are being very carefully assessed. So we will have the answers eventually. I yeah. think uh, the, the SNAP trial is very reassuring in this respect. Uh, whether there is anything else e-cigarettes do uh, on top of what patches do, I suppose more of these women are likely to be vaping through pregnancy. With patches, uh, they probably stopped using the patches early on. Uh, the, the adherence to patches was very low in the SNAP trial. So I think well, we will we will have definitive answers. Uh, I think at the moment, thinking back about this discussion about uh, whether whether to recommend these cigarettes in pregnancy, I think reassuring people and uh, allowing them to use it is absolutely fine. Whether this, whether we should start already proactively giving pregnant smokers e-cigarettes, I think that's a matter of opinion at the moment. I think. Mm -hmm. You know, the trial will provide definitive answers. If it's safe as, as we think it is, uh, then that would be absolutely legitimate to do it. Whether to do it now before the trial results are in, I think that's a call. Yeah, so there's a distinction to be drawn between supporting women who are, who are making that choice and proactively providing the products as part of a, of a service. Yes. Yeah, I think... Just to go back sorry, to my, yeah, sorry, it is about em emphasizing to women that these are consumer products that they may choose to purchase. I think we are straying into difficult territory before the PrEP trial is provided to say that we should be handing these products out to pregnant women. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And uh, another point that's been raised is, is a, uh, in through your presentation, particularly Peter, is this sort of pattern of, of uh, the different pattern of use with e-cigarettes compared to NRT. The fact that people are likely to be using them longer term. Uh, and the, the, that increases, I guess, the likelihood that women might be coming to pregnancy having quit in preparation for becoming pregnant, but, but um, becoming pregnant while they're vaping. Where are we, what advice are we providing to those women, do you think, uh, who are coming to pregnancy having quit smoking but are still vaping? Peter, I think there will be a sort of precautionary advice that it may be better not to vape if they are able to stop vaping during pregnancy as well, would be my advice. But if they prefer to carry on vaping, then of course it's much preferable to going back to smoking. So I would have a, a, a pre, you know, preference for nothing followed by uh, vaping followed by smoking. Yes. Linda, would you add anything to that? Um, or sorry. Anything? Um, I mean, <sighs> If a woman comes to an antenatal appointment and she's vaping, that means that probably relatively recently she's been smoking. And we know that, um, I mean, there might be the odd woman who's been vaping for five years, you know, this is possible as well. But we know because of the chronic relapsing nature of tobacco use uh, in the prenatal and during pregnancy and the postnatal period, um, as Peter says, in an ideal world, nobody would vape. But if she's vaping, she's probably a fairly recent ex-smoker and the priority is to make sure she doesn't go back to smoking. So I think that has to be a clear message. The, the research question for, for Peter and I and for others is um, in terms of the fact that so many women relapse after they give birth, mm. um, will vaping during pregnancy, a bit like Peter's hypothesis about his ongoing vapors in his tech trial, will this actually help us with this real big problem mm. Uh, postpartum. And Caitlin Notley at University of East Anglia has just finished a small feasibility study that's looking at that and she's applying for more funding now. Louise, is that something that you have experience of in the services, people uh, arriving um, into pregnancy vaping and, and looking for advice? Certainly we do get ladies that um, book with us at the first contact and have um, disclosed that they are vaping and I agree I think it's really important that we have a key conversation with them around um, you know the the use of e-cigarettes however if they have recently stopped which in my experience it is a tool they're using to quit smoking then mm. you know we should praise them for that and be mindful of um, the fact that we don't want them to go back to smoking and also mindful of the fact that our smoking stop smoking service can support them as well if they've recently quit smoking thank you i just move back to the issue of nicotine again so we've a question um about women who, who might be more heavily dependent on cigarettes than others. So if a woman smokes throughout the night, would a 24 hour patch be considered? Um, Linda, you mentioned the fact that the patches are not recommended for use during the night during pregnancy. Is that something you could speak to? Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, there's a difference between what we routinely advise, uh, not me, but clinicians, and um, <clears throat> what happens in practice. You do tend to see in studies and the qualitative research that's been done that that's exactly what women do. They know they're not supposed to use it overnight, ideally, but they find that it's not being that helpful, so they do put it on at night. So I think I, I really welcome Louise's perspective on this as a, as a, as a specialist and as an advisor. Um, I think if women find that helpful, we shouldn't be deterring them from doing that. There's, there's reasons why we advise not to, but um, the risks are going to be very minimal. Louise, do you have something to add on that? Louise? I haven't, I haven't had um, much feedback from any patients I've looked after for um, through the night being a problem. Um, women are quite receptive to the patches uh, and a second product along with that. Um, I certainly haven't had much experience of, um, of through the night concerns, um, but obviously a maternity service is um, a 24 hour and if we have a newly delivered patient, then, um, you know, through the night is a time when they may require first require a patch um, so it's just clearing up any confusion for um, medical staff and midwives of when to actually apply that patch if the guidance is we can't use them at night 
well, actually, is that woman actually going in a period of sleep at that time? Would it be beneficial for her to have that at that point? And I guess that sort of speaks to the need to have a fairly nuanced conversation that is personalised to the smoker about their smoking and, and the importance of specialists being involved and specialist midwives being involved in supporting pregnant women. Um, I mean, it, presumably that, Joe. I wonder if I could bring you in to talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of being able to have those more nuanced conversations with women um, and, and the need to make sure that we have those things in place locally. Yeah, I think well, I think you've, you've covered it there. I think the the individual support for women based on their smoking, their quit journey, and their pregnancy is is really important. Um, and so having that um, swift referral from um, the midwife in the booking appointment or other antenatal appointments to someone with um, specialist stop smoking. Um, uh, training is is really important and that might be another another specialist midwife within the maternity team or it might be out to the stop smoking service um, but but being able to have that longer conversation um, about what's right for that woman is 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 really important and I think the the model that we're we're looking at across that system um, to try and um, implement in in maternity services is where the the midwives are able to have to raise the issue, do the carbon monoxide monitoring and um, and have a brief conversation, brief but meaningful conversation with women about their smoking and also um, uh, encourage them to attend and en engage with the specialist support that's available so that they can have those more nuanced conversations and make sure that they get the right information, right consistent information and can can choose a quitting method that's that's right for them really. So I think that's that's really important about having that whole system approach where um, uh, where, where the whole maternity team and then the specialist stop smoking advisor <coughs> or, or stop smoking service is, is engaged and accessed quickly uh, so that women can have those, um, those more detailed conversations. I'll, I'm, I'm going to make a little public service announcement from Sue Cooper from Nottingham University just to add a bit to what Linda said. So she says, um, just to mention a bit more information about the new programme mentioned by Linda, which is being led by Tim Coleman. Um, in this study, in addition to providing dual NRT, there will be a multi-factor tailored support package to improve women's adherence to NRT, um, as that's probably one of the reasons why it doesn't work very well, which is something discussed by both Peter and, and Linda. Um, so I will circulate the information about that program if people are, are interested in more information. Sue's provided a link, so we'll circulate that. And we also have a specific question, Peter, about your trial. So, Peter, are you looking for more pregnant women to be included in the trial and how can local stop smoking services help to identify women? At the moment, the recruitment is fine, but if we get some kind of recruitment fatigue in some sites and they are not recruiting well, uh, including new sites would be a possibility. So if there are services willing to chip in, we would certainly like to hear from them. Okay, so if you're on the line and you're interested in, in Peter's um, uh, research, there's no promises, but let us know and we'll pass your information on to Peter um, in case he gets some recruitment fatigue. Um, we've got a couple of specific questions, which I think, Louise, maybe you would be best placed to answer. Um, there's a question here about, we're talking about using 15 milligram, milligram patches. Um, what about the 25 milligram patches, would we not, not be looking to use those in pregnancy? Um, it, within our trust, we use um, the 25 milligram patches and the 15 milligram patches. Um, it depends on the, um, the assessment made by the midwife at the time. So the CO monitoring and how many um, the patient smokes. What we want is to have the right amount um, of nicotine in the patch for the patient so that they don't have other cravings, either whilst an inpatient or as an outpatient, and then turn back to cigarettes. It's all done on an individual um, basis. Um, yeah. And this is rolled out across maternity. Um, and then we've used maternity as a model for the trust smoke-free um, nicotine decision aid as well. So, so again, it's about tailoring the support to the woman in front of you and, and not presupposing um, that it would be a 15 milligram patch they would need or a 25 milligram or, or a different product altogether. Absolutely, because 
you need agreement from the woman. It needs to be um, a good discussion with the woman. It needs to look at her needs and what actually is going to be more successful for her rather than us saying, this is what we're going to give you. Actually, is she going to engage if we give her a product that isn't actually that appealing to her or won't meet her needs? And, and and this is, I think, a question for, for Peter and, and Linda, perhaps. So uh, there's a question being asked about whether we would recommend um, or encourage a, a reduction plan, presumably a nicotine reduction plan, um, with the use of e-cigarettes. Um, it's phrased quite broadly, um, but I don't know whether we would um, think about that just in relation to pregnancy. Uh, you know, more broadly, would you recommend if smokers are using e-cigarettes that they uh, take an, uh, an approach where they seek to reduce the level of nicotine over time? Uh, and is that something you would also recommend in pregnancy? Peter, question to you first. I, I personally would not. I would let them to find the level of nicotine they find satisfying and, uh, and use that. Uh, that may not be everybody's opinion. When our paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, with this trial, their editorial uh, was saying, okay, then you know, use e-cigarettes, but make sure that people come of them as quickly as possible and they use only the lowest nicotine level they can possibly uh, have. And I think that's a, a counterproductive advice. I mm -hmm. wouldn't be that much worried about a slight difference in level of nicotine. I'd be worried about relapse and going yeah. back to smoke. Linda, would you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think there is a there's a bit of an obsession in the literature, often coming from the US, about you know reducing the amount of nicotine in vaping, and that's what everybody should be doing. I mean, we do see in the in the population studies that that does tend to happen naturally. Mm -hmm anyway people want to reduce the nicotine this is not pregnant specific um but i know i would i would agree with uh with peter probably particularly for this group actually who are at such high risk of relapse um that i i i think the beginning of your question was more a bit more concerning to me hazel which is should we be endorsing a cutting down approach um with vaping in pregnancy mm. And, you know, our formal advice through the NICE guidance pre-cigarettes is that there really are no benefits to cutting down in pregnancy and that women should aim to stop completely. And that, that remains the message. But clearly in practice, um, you know, what women do in practice often is start by cutting down rather than qu quitting completely. And I think advisors are well placed to deal with that. And I'd be interested in Louise's view. Just one other comment. I, I understand, as you say, that Sue Cooper is on the line. Um, just to acknowledge that Sue led that longer term follow up analysis from the SNAP trial. That's very much her work. And um, so it's great that she's listening as well and may also be able to chip in. But I, yeah, I'd be just interested in Louise's view on this. Um, you know, women do cut down even though we're advising them to stop completely. Yes, Louise. Presumably that's a very common occurrence that women are coming and saying, oh, well, I've reduced the number of cigarettes I've smoked. Um, that's enough. Yeah, very common. Lots and lots of um, ladies, when we have the discussions with them, will say, oh, well, I've cut down. Um, it's about the midwives being confident in the response to that and, and, and um, using the CO monitoring as a great tool for that and actually showing them, well, you know, we, we, you've blown a 10 or 15 last time and you've cut down and actually we're still seeing the same levels of CO because you're smoking the cigarette differently. You know, um, it, it's about education. It really is about educating mm -hmm. the women um, in a non-judgmental way, really, um, and, and trying to work in partnership with them as well to um, find an alternative to cutting down. And it strikes me it's not just about educating the women. Jo, I wonder if I could bring you in. I know that various bits of work and research that we've done um, together, you know, looking at professionals understanding both of nicotine and, um, you know, the benefits of cutting down. You know, there is widespread misunderstanding among professional groups here, which could be undermining successful quit attempts. Yeah, I think I, th I think that that's that's true, and it's not we're not just talking about um, the sort of midwifery and related workforce. I think that's um, there's evidence that there are misperceptions and misconceptions amongst um, a lot of health professionals about nicotine and um, and smoking, and and then that, those messages around cutting down, which. Um, can all compound um, the pregnant woman receiving different 
messages from different health professionals um, as well as different uh, members of their social networks and families as well which can be confusing so um, as you say a lot of the work that we're doing um, within the maternity space and then also looking um, at how we can get information and messages and training and guidance to other health professionals as well around that difference between smoking and nicotine um, and and where vaping sits within that and why that that's you know that's, that's different as well um to to make sure that to as large extent as we can women will be receiving consistent messages about the risks of smoking during pregnancy and what what the um, what the difference is with in terms of nicotine use and also why switching um, or stopping smoking completely is is so is so important um, but it, there, it is a challenge and there are mixed messages out there and the trials um, and the quality of work that Linda was talking about earlier on clearly shows that and other research than survey work that we've done with with health professionals um, tells us that we're still still work to do to ensure that consistent messaging is um, uh, um, is being given to um, to women particularly from from the healthcare professionals that they might engage with so we have developed new training and also in, in the process of developing a range of different training resources as well for um, different healthcare professionals because we know that people have different training needs training opportunities and time to engage with some of these resources so we've got online training modules available um, but we're also developing developing some short films and some um, what we might call classroom resources so that those people who are um, holding local training sessions or have maybe got a short period of time on a mandatory training session can dip into those and um, and use them um, use some of those resources to try and help their local teams to um to be um, on message and also confident with with the messages around smoking cutting down nicotine vaping um, as well in um, the e-learning for healthcare um, platform will will hope be hosting all of those resources as well as some really useful stuff on the NCSCT website um, uh, briefings being updated as well as we speak Can thank I you Jay. right I, okay. sorry go on Peter uh, we also run once a year an update for service practitioners and commissioners with Robert West and it's called the annual <clears throat> uh, update and supervision uh, course. And it's the sort of continuing professional development type of thing. And it typically has got the section uh, on pregnancy and e-cigarettes are usually heavily uh, covered because this is the main development at the moment. The events summarize new findings and new research over the year and what it means for practice and has got some kind of uh, supervision of clinical practice in it as well. It always takes uh, December, and I suppose Ash could give you details if you're interested. We, we can pass we them on. We absolutely, absolutely could. We'll circulate information both about the things that Joe mentioned there and Peter's um, uh, course as well. Um, so we're, we're, we're coming to the last minute or so. Um, I would just ask uh, ask. Our, our speakers thank them for their contributions it's been really interesting Q&A um, if I'm just going to say a few more words and then I'm going to come to all of you very briefly and ask you for you know the one thing that you would like people to take away from from today's um, session the most important message that they could take away um, but before I come and ask you that I just want to let people know that we will be circulating links to all these resources and the link to the um, smoke free uh, pregnancy information network so you can sign up and get regular updates we are also updating the challenge group e-cigarette resources which various people have have alluded to and um, we'll be circulating those as well um, and uh, there's also a webinar that's already online that Linda did um, a little while ago that was just on e-cigarettes um, so there'll be some more information in that if you want to listen to it so I will just come very, very quickly, rapidly round our speakers. What's the one message that you want people to take away from today's session? Peter, I'll start with you. Uh, I suppose my talk was about uh, an evidence we now have that e-cigarettes can help smokers quit. Thank you. Joe? Um, I think that um, 
uh, supporting our healthcare professionals to have the right um, knowledge and skills and confidence um, with the you know, a lot of the information that has been presented today um, is is really going to going to make a difference. And um, if um, if people on the call can um, can share the resources available with their teams, um, that will really help to um, to make a difference to that system wide consistent approach. Louise. Oh, we've lost Louise. Linda, one thing that you want people to take away? Uh, well, just that pregnant women read the newspaper like the rest of us, and we live in an era of huge confusion on nicotine and e-cigarettes in particular. And, uh, you know, midwives and health professionals are the route to accurate information along with the challenge group resources and others. So that we have a real responsibility to try and communicate about, about nicotine and also e-cigarettes as clearly as we can. Brilliant. Thank you to all of the speakers and to, to Joe and Louise for joining us um, for the Q&A session and for all of your questions. Uh, and do sign up for our incentives um, seminar later in the month and uh, we'll be in touch with all of the information that we've been discussing today. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.